Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Please stand and we'll begin in prayer. Since this is the, uh, the week of the octave of Pentecost, Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, to the ages of ages. Amen. O heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come, O good one, and dwell in us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls. And since the Mother of God is the object of the particular love of the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, Hail, O Virgin Theotokos, Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, for thou hast borne the Savior of our souls. Thank you very much, Father Joseph. Please welcome back Dr. Stephen Smith. Uh, great to be with you. And uh, last week, you know, we, I think we did a lot of good work in kind of preparing, getting the background, ready to dive into our study. And we made it into two verses. <laughs> so tonight we've got a bit of ground to cover and let's, uh, let's get started. All right. Uh, so we left off looking at the first couple verses of Ephesians chapter 1, 1 and 2, Paul's greeting. What follows next, and you, if you want to um, follow along on your outline, that would be on the top of page 8 is what I call the Trinitarian blessing, which follows immediately on the heels of Paul's greeting. It's basically verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1, and so let's begin by reading that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the, wis the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you first heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed, were sealed with the, promise of the, whole, with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." And the first thing I want to say is, wow, Paul, could you pack anything else into that prayer? Um, this actually in the Greek is two sentences. And the one coming up after this is, is the longest sentence in the New Testament. It's pretty amazing. So let's try to get into uh, this section here and uh, try to consider what Paul's doing. The first thing I would say, just to get us warmed up, is that what I just read for you is Paul's prayer to the Ephesians. And when you read any of Paul's letters, what you're going to find is that he prays for them. And in some ways, I'm tempted to say, unlike our prayers, he also uses them to teach. And so you may want to make a note of this, not in the outline, that Paul's prayers are deeply saturated in theology. We obtain a lot of our doctrine and Christology from the New Testament, from Paul's prayers. And this one is no exception. 
It's also Trinitarian in the sense that we can see Paul's reference to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit throughout the prayer, as we just read. Now, some particulars about the, uh, the section itself. Verse 3, where it says, Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens? The first thing I want you to see is that the blessing is the gift of the Holy Spirit itself. So if you were wondering what it is that Paul's referring to at the very end of the prayer, he tells us what that blessing is. It's sort of like there's a fountain of blessings, plural, but in the singular, the gift of blessing is the Holy Spirit himself. The origin of all grace is in heaven, from God the Father, and bestows that upon his children through Christ in the Holy Spirit. As I said, it's a very richly Trinitarian prayer. Now notice too in verses 3 and 5, we get this reference to um, he destined for us, right, before the foundations of the world. This is interesting because what Paul's doing here is he's telling the Ephesians that they have this great gift of the Holy Spirit, they have this in Christ from God the Father, but it was from before the world even began. As it says on the outline, before creation, God's plan for us was already set in motion. You know, sometimes people say, well, didn't God's plan for salvation really begin back in Genesis 3, right? Where you read what we call the Proto-Evangelion, right? The first gospel. In a sense, you could say that's the case, but more technically, it's before the world began. God's plan for salvation began before the creation of the world himself. Because God is love and God destined us to dwell in his love. And Paul wants them to know this, and it's very important to see this at the outset, that he wants them to know this because he, he's of the mind that once they get this, everything else will sort of fall into place. Now, I'm not trying to be too simplistic about it, but for Paul, it's, you could almost say, just that simple or just that easy and also just that hard. Once they understand, once we understand what we're destined for, if we could get just a glimpse of the vision that Paul saw, I think Paul's convinced that it would completely transform our lives upside down. All right, let's move on and look at a, um, some of the subsequent verses here in the passage. In verse 5, verse 5, he talks about the love of Jesus Christ. Let me read it for us. He predestined us for adoption as sons, sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. The Father's plan is a plan of salvation, a plan of redemption. Sometimes, if, you, you know, if you've uh, ever met like an you know, evangelical Christian or fundamentalist, sometimes they may ask you on the street, are you saved? By the way, the Catholic should say, I have been saved by Christ. I'm being saved and I hope to be saved. I have been saved by what he did for me on the cross. I'm being saved because Paul says elsewhere, work out your salvation with Fear and trev trembling, live it out. And I hope to be saved, that is to say, we want to be humble and to press on. Even Paul himself says, I run in such a way as to win the prize. Okay? Um, but God's plan is a plan of salvation. Not only saved uh, from something, that is to say, eternal damnation, but saved for something. What's the for? Well, that's the letter of Ephesians and what, what it's all about. If you want to know what we're saved for, read and study the book of Ephesians. The Father's plan is a manifestation of his boundless, extravagant love for all humanity. And by all humanity, I mean Jews and Gentiles. Because for Paul, there's only two groups of people in the world. You know that old phrase, there's two types of people in the world? It's true. For Paul, it's Jews or Gentiles. You're one or the other. And what he's doing is addressing all of humanity. That is to say, all of those who were the children of the covenant, the Jewish people. And now, and this is the extraordinary part, all the Gentiles, which by extrapolation would include all of us. It is through Jesus and him alone that we become sons and daughters. Turn for a moment, if you would, just to John's Gospel, chapter 1. I was blessed to teach uh, the Gospel of John at Mount St. Mary's Seminary uh, this last spring. And one of my favorite verses in the prologue here, we'll just take a look at for a moment. In chapter 1, verse 12 of John's Gospel, John writes, let's back up to verse 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Already John is talking about the rejection of the Messiah. He came to his own, his own received him not. But now look at verse 12. But 
to all who did receive him, who all who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, that means, in other words, by human means, but of God. As it is for John, so it is for Paul. We are adopted into God's family. That's who we are. Okay? This is the great um, mystery of salvation, that although we did nothing to earn it, God has adopted us as his own sons. It's like the father and the prodigal son story, right? He sees us as lost and runs out when he sees the prodigal son coming home, returning to the father before the son can even reach him. The father is there with his extravagant love reaching out to the son. And we are all those sons and daughters. Okay, turn the page if you would, page 9. And uh, let's move on talk about uh, verse 7 here, where he gets into some pretty rich theology. He's talking about the redemption we, we have in the, through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of our trespasses or sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, the term redemption, theologically, and for Paul here, refers to freedom, to liberty. Paul's gospel is a, is a gospel of true freedom, true proclamation. It was true in Paul's day, and it's true in our day. The world today, as you know, lives in search of freedom, whatever we can do to be more free. Right? And what Paul is telling the Ephesians, and through them telling all of us, what true freedom looks like. And it's defined in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It refers to the freedom that was gained as in paying of a ransom. In chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, Paul will describe the reasons for why this redemption was needed. And we'll come to that in just a couple of moments. But namely, it's our sin and our disobedience. So while he's, he's uh, girding them up, right? This is what Paul does so beautifully. While he's kind of saying, these are the riches you have from before the creation of the world, he's not afraid to tell them the truth and nothing but the truth. Tough love. Paul will always do both. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, which... He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Interesting phrase, right? The riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. The word in Latin is very interesting. It actually means superabundance. And some, most of your translations probably won't have that. They may have lavished or some other term. But it's really superabundance. Or like, again, like a fountain that's pouring over. I just had a chance on this last Sunday to go up to uh, Westchester, New York, and deliver a pre-Cana retreat to about 40 engaged couples. And many of them had never heard the wedding feast of Cana, or at least had not heard it for so long that they nearly had forgotten all of it. And we got to the whole idea of what was this miracle really all about? And many in the room, honestly, were, seemed a bit uncertain or you might say even stumped about what this is all about. You know, I guess it means Jesus is divine, he can do miracles, but that's just the beginning. I suggested to them and I suggest to you that the purpose of that miracle and of every miracle is not only to show us that Jesus can do great and grand things, but to show us what the kingdom of God looks like. Right? In John's Gospel, the wedding feast at Cana ends with this phrase, thus Jesus manifested himself to his disciples and revealed his glory. So the purpose of the miracle is not simply that he does great things or only that he is God, although he is God, but it shows us the glory of God himself in Jesus Christ, the revealed son. And it's interesting here because in a similar way, Paul seems to want to get to the crux of what salvation is all about, and it is this superabundant life. In the wedding feast at Cana, it says that there were six stone jars, each holding 20 to 30 gallons of water for ritual purity. Now you do the math, and that's, you know, 150 to 180 gallons. The only question left is how many people were at the wedding? We're not told. We're not told. If it was about the size of my wedding, 150, I'd be shocked. It was probably something more like 70 to 100. Let's just say it was possibly 100, small town. You know, 180 gallons of wine, 100 people. Way to go, Jesus, right? Is that the interpretation? <laughs> Keep the party going. Well, Jesus is not stingy with joy and love and, in fact, even wine. But I think the purpose goes much deeper than, than that. The point, I think, is that they could not possibly consume all the wine. It was an outlandish supply of this magnificent divine Chablis, if you will, right? 
And the point was, in the t- when the Messiah comes, his love is going to pour out in a superabundant way that it cannot be consumed. You, you just can't get to the end of it. He's, he's, God will not be outdone, as I like to say, in his radical generosity. And Paul has tapped into that same theology here, and he's reminding them of that in verse 8. Aquinas says that the, uh, um, let's look at the, uh, the note here, that the us, which he lavished upon us, refers first and foremost to the apostles. In fact, he says um, that it is rash, if not an error, to say that those who dare to equate the grace and glory of some saints with that of the apostles. Now, he's not not trying to downgrade or diminish us or other saints. What he's trying to do is make sure we have a a proper theology of the disciples, specifically of the apostles. He says, greater dignity was preordained by God to some saints, and hence he infused grace more abundantly into them. God's grace superabounded on the apostles, enriching them with all wisdom. For the apostles were set over the church to be her pastors. Now what that means is, you know, when we walk into a church and you see the stained glass windows or you see the various stains, sometimes in statues like St. Joseph or St. Peter and Paul or others, right? Or whenever we think of the apostles, maybe it's our, in our, 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 our baptismal name, maybe in a prayer card, our favorite saint, we ought to thank God that God infused a superabundant amount of grace in them, right? Amen. Through which all the graces flow through them to the church. And at the very head of all of those is the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is why Catholics pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? As the fountain through which all graces graces flow from Christ through her to all of the church. Amen? All right. Verse 13, verse 10, uh, verse 10, sorry. He has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will. Now, uh, once again, I'm leaning on Thomas Aquinas here, and I want to just pause for a moment before I get to my uh, point and say, last week someone asked me, well, what are some good commentaries to read on Ephesians? My own favorite is Thomas' Aquinas. I brought it with. Um, it's a little hard to get. You can probably get it um, in a used bookstore or if you have access to Amazon or know someone who does, you can just type in Aquinas and Ephesians and you can get a copy. It's really not too expensive these days. Um, as far as a modern commentary, I recommend uh, a friend of mine, Peter Williamson, who teaches at Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, and that book is simply called Ephesians, but the series is called Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. Okay, Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture by Peter Williamson. So a modern commentary, an ancient, and on your outline I've, I've smattered in here a few, um, a few uh, golden nuggets from the early church, like St. Ambrose, your patron saint here at this parish, and, uh, and others as well. And we'll get to some of those in due time later this evening. But anyways, with verse 10, what St. Thomas Aquinas taught us was that the mystery of his will that's been hidden through all the ages is above all the incarnation. So he says, so the cause of the incarnation was concealed from everyone except those to whom God revealed it through the Holy Spirit. And so, what is this mystery that it was hidden for St. Thomas Aquinas? It's very simple. It's the incarnation. Because the incarnation of Jesus Christ represents the entire gift, you might say. Beyond, beyond the incarnation, it looks forward to the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, the pouring out of his graces. That all begins, if you will, with the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, let's reacquaint ourselves with it. He says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Um, Here we come to the crux of Paul's message, right? Euangelion, the gospel. And I want to give you a a nice little quote here from one of my favorite non-Catholic theologians. His name is N.T. Wright. Anybody heard of N.T. Wright? Probably one of the foremost Pauline scholars today. Um, He just came out with a book last November on on the Apostle Paul. It's 1,081 pages. When I finish it, I'll get back to you on what I think about it. Here's what he says. N.T. Wright. Put all this together. He's talking about the whole prayer here. And what do we have The worldview of Saul of Tarsus. We have precisely the gospel, the euangelion, the good news, rooted in the good news, spoken in the great prophet Isaiah, confronting the good news carved in stone around Caesar's empire. 
Remember last week I taught you what Wright said, right? To say that Jesus is Lord is to say that blank is not. Who's the blank? The Caesar, right? It's very provocative saying that Paul says when he says Jesus is Lord. We have the symbol by which Paul declared that he himself defined the anchor of his own vocational mindset. Please turn the page. Page 10 on your outline. And concluding the quotation from Wright under Roman numeral 4, at the end of his catechesis on uh, this section, he says, I just love this sentence, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. It defined Paul. It defined his work. It defined his communities. It was the shorthand summary of the theology, which in turn was the foundation for the central pillar of what he calls the new worldview, the kingdom of God. It carried God's power. The worldview and those who lived by it were going to need it. Verse 12, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. Now here, I just want to alert you that Paul is beginning to now um, move into a discussion with the Jewish people. He doesn't always tell us that he's doing it, but if you look closely in the text, he gives us clues that he's going to say certain things to the Jewish members of the church and then other things to the non-Jewish or Gentile members of the church. And here, he's talking specifically to the Jewish people. We who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. Um, later on in chapter 2, he's going to talk about some of the things that the Gentiles now have, but he, you have to remember that Paul, as I said last week, first and foremost, is a Jew. He's now a completed Jew in the sense that he's accepted the Messiah. It's changed his entire world. And he's going to tell the Jewish people that through the covenants God made with them in the Old Testament, they were given this great inheritance, but it must not stay only with them. God's grace is like a river, not a reservoir, right? And some of the problems that the Jewish people encountered in the Old Testament times is when they were, were, um, adopted what I call a reservoir mentality, when they hoarded that grace for themselves rather than letting it flow through them. And the same principle applies to us today. It's a good thing when we grow in Christ, when we come to things like ICC, and we're, a lot of us involved in other ministries, and we're growing and being nurtured by God. This is what he wants. But he also desires greatly for each one of us, to the best of our ability, to allow those graces to, throw, to flow through us. Verse 13, near the end of the prayer, let's talk about this, sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? In a certain sense, you might say this kind of prefigures, in a sacramental way, the, the sacrament of confirmation, right? But also, certainly, Paul is probably thinking baptismally here, because a lot of these people were newly baptized, um, let's, let's read this here. Uh, this is from Peter Williamson, uh, letter I. In the ancient world, when a letter or a legal document was marked in wax with the seal, sphragis in Greek, of its author, the seal gave evidence of its authenticity. The gift of the Spirit that Christians have received functions as a seal in the same way. It marks us as belonging to God and under His protection. It is the proof of our adoption as sons and daughters. Now, as you can see, that's just his opening prayer. And already, he's given us a lot to think about, right? The foundations of the church, this great mystery of the gospel that was hidden in the age, from the ages until the time of the incarnation. All these great gifts that he's been describing. And as Al Pacino says, he's just getting warmed up. No one? No one's seen Son of a Woman? All right, let's move on. <laughs> All right, chapter uh, 1, verse 15 to 23 is one long sentence. In fact, the longest single sentence in the Greek New Testament. Overall, it does express the, Paul's desire that the Ephesians grasp the glorious future that God has in store for them and the might of his power to bring it about. All right, let's take a look and read it now, beginning in verse 15. Down to 23, everybody take a breath, because in Greek, all one sentence. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, 
that you may know what is the hope to which he called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as a head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, your translation may read slightly differently. I'm again using um, a pretty recent or fresh translation called the English Standard Version. A lot of you may have either the New Revised uh, or sorry, the Revised Standard Version or the New American Bible or some I know have others here. But um, Let's, let's try to understand what Paul's getting at in this section. And I think a key verse to begin with is, um, is verse 18. Let's take a look at it. Verse 18, he says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Um, Paul, it's interesting, in the early church, baptism was known as the sacrament of enlightenment. Sacrament of Enlightenment. So it's interesting, right, that he's just talked about being sealed, right, with the Holy Spirit. And now he's talking about having the eyes of the heart, as it were, opened up or enlightened. I'll take you back to John's Gospel for a moment. You probably know that John's Gospel has these great I am sayings, right? I am the bread of life. Who can name some other ones? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's John 14. What else? I am the resurrection and the life. That's John 11, right? There's at least six major I am sayings. And why that's important is when Jesus says I am, and then he has this description after, like I am the bread of life, he's actually using the same words in Greek by which God in the, Old, in the Greek Old Testament revealed his name to Moses. Ego eimi, I am, the divine name. So every time Jesus says that, it's like he's reminding everyone, I, I and the Father are one. I am truly divine. Okay, now why am I telling you this? I'm telling you because there's only one instance in John's Gospel where someone other than Jesus Christ says the word, I am. And where it happens is interesting. It's in John chapter 9, after Jesus heals the man at the pool of Siloam, right? And when he identifies himself, he uses the same phrase, ego a me, I am. Now John chooses his words very carefully. So what's going on here? Why does he so many times have Jesus say, I am, and now this man who Jesus um, heals, right, now he says it. Is it just kind of a slip, or is Paul just kind of a little bit of a stylistic preference here? No. The early church informed us well that what was understood by what, what Jesus had done in John 9 was divinize him. That is to say that underneath the miracle, there is a baptismal catechesis going on. On the, on the literal level, Jesus heals a man born blind. On a deeper mystical or spiritual level, you could say that it's a mystery of baptism. That that man is now enlightened because he has been baptized in Jesus Christ. Because of that, a lot of the early church fathers who recognized that connection, that I am connection, believed that John's gospel was a baptismal catechesis. And interestingly, the symbol of water is all over John's gospel. I, I mean, I don't have time to, to take you through it here, but in John chapter 2, the water turned into wine. John chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well. Uh, John chapter 7, uh, the water at Tabernacles. John chapter 9, the blood and water. It's all over the place. So it may be well the case that in John's mystical theology, there's a sense that when we're baptized, when we're in Christ, we're on this road, as it were, to divinization. And I'll talk more about that later because Paul is also very invested in this divinization theology as well. I'll explain it as we go a bit more further along here. But let's keep on with verse 18 here, right? And um, in, this in this next part of the prayer... Thomas Aquinas, once again, comes to bat for us, and he identifies four qualities of spiritual gifts given to the church. Let me again read the verse. 
having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And on that very verse, St. Thomas wants us to know that there are four qualities of spiritual gifts to the church. What's beautiful about St. Thomas is he's so precise in his understanding. He just goes so slowly, unpacks things a step at a time. It's like, how do you eat an elephant, right? Just one morsel at a time. That's St. Thomas. So here he goes. First, riches implies that they are abundant, right? We've already talked about that. So let's move forward. Secondly, he says, with respect to the word glory, they are sure. These riches that we have in Christ are sure. They are certain. We can rest upon them. We can rely upon them. We can trust them. We can trust God that he's truly going to give them to us. Thirdly, he says the word inheritance in this verse implies that they are enduring. Isn't that beautiful the way he does this theology? A step at a time, sees a word, and it kind of explains the mystery behind it. So they're abundant. They're, they're sure. They're most enduring. And then fourthly, on the last page there, page 11, he says they will be seen in the future time to be most profound, to be most profound. And then he references um, in his commentary, Romans 8.18. I'll read it for us. It's right on the page. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that which is to be revealed to us. Okay? And St. Thomas thinks on the same plane as St. Paul, which is to say, in a certain way, sort of like outside of space and time, right? He kind of sees past present and future. Our, you know, our day and age, folks, is always talking about living in the present moment. Living in the present moment is so important in many ways. If you're a married person, you know it's very important to stay in the present moment when you're having a conversation with your children, with other people. It's just important to be present in the moment. But let's not forget what St. Thomas and also St. Paul are teaching us, and that is we need a good view of the past to know where we came from. We need a view of the, the the present to know where we're at, and we need a view of the future as well. And that's what the beautiful thing about St. Paul is he's always thinking past, present, and future, even when we're caught up in the present moment. Verse 20, um, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in the heavenly places. The language of the apostle acknowledging the power of God refers to future things, future things as though they have already happened. This is a beautiful insight I got from St. Hilary, early church father, St. Hilary. So in other words, he's again reinforcing what St. Thomas said, also what Paul is saying here, that there's all these great things, some of which we've only begun to unpack and open, right? There's still much more to come. I suspect that in, uh, in Paul's journey, right, there was this moment when he was taken up in the so-called third heaven. Saw there that was so mind-blowing that when he kind of came back down to earth, he might, because he says whether it was in the body or spirit, I do not know, but you know, once he kind of, once that vision ended and he got back to doing ministry with people, he wanted them to know in every way possible what was in store for them. Um, I wasn't planning on saying this, but um, I think maybe you heard it in the prayer. Um, yesterday I got some very sad news that my father-in-law passed away. He was 82, and it was very sudden and unexpected. My wife's already en route to the funeral. I'll be going there early tomorrow morning. And, um, you know, my daughter asked me, who's 11 years old, you know, she, my daughter uh, called him Umpa. You know, she said, Daddy, is, is Umpa in a better place? And without, just without knee-jerk, I said, you bet. Absolutely he is. Absolutely he is. And I wish that in her little heart, but also in our own hearts, we could just ponder what Paul is saying. When we fear the future, when we fear things like death, when there's so many anxieties on our mind, because, bless him, St. Paul has given us such a great gift in the book of Ephesians to tell us about so much that is in store that we do not even yet begin to comprehend. Verse 22, he has put all things under his feet and made them head over uh, all things for the church, I love what Thomas Aquinas says here. He says, everything is subject to Christ. The just or righteous person will do so voluntarily by embracing the will of God. The unjust will be subjected to him in a final judgment. Another way of saying it is, you're going to bow, bow the knee to Jesus Christ. You're either going to do it voluntarily, Thomas says, or you're going to do it not voluntarily. The choice is up to you. 
With that in mind, let's turn uh, the page and turn to chapter 2. Chapter 2. In the previous lesson, Paul, uh, we looked at uh, several detailed prayers of Paul. Now we move in really to the body of his letter. And in this letter that remains, uh, I want to give you a little schema for, for, to understand what's to come. I've also given you on the last page of your outline sort of a detailed outline you can take a look at. Maybe you have already. But the basics of it are this. There's really two parts. Part A is proclamation and part B, exhortation. Or in other words, part A, doctrine and dogma. Part B, moral catechesis. So chapters 2 and 3 is really going to be this doctrinal section where he's got a lot to tell them about Christology and ecclesiology and so on and so forth. And then the latter part of the letter, chapters 4 and 6, which we'll get to next week, is really going to be where he ends with very powerful, punchy, moral admonishments to them. Okay, So what we're going to deal with then tonight, at least in substance, is what remains of this proclamation or doctrinal section. So let's look at chapter 2. And he begins this way, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among those, we all once lived in the, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raises, raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now let's take a look at some of the uh, theology in this section here. Paul says that they were made alive, and then he contrasts this with, you were dead. By his glorious cross, Christ has won salvation for all men. Listen to what the Catechism says. For freedom, Christ has set us free. In him we have communion with the truth that makes us free. Notice again how the Catechism, when it talks about salvation and the gospel, keeps emphasizing this theme of freedom, true liberty, true freedom. The Holy Spirit has been given to us, and as the Apostle teaches here, talking about the Apostle Paul, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's the theme once again in 2 Corinthians. Already we glory in the liberty of the children of God. And there are the catechisms reminding us that the greatest freedom is still off in the future. Verse 2 talks about the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, and so on. Um, we're going to get more into this next week, this whole theme of spiritual warfare, but already Paul is summoning, up, summoning us up for battle. Now listen to what St. John Chrysostom says. Why does he call the devil the ruler of this world? Because virtually the whole of the humanity has already surrendered to him. All are, all are his voluntarily and willing slaves. Few pay any heed to Christ who promises unnumbered blessings. Rather, they follow after the devil, who promises nothing but leads them all to hell. He rules in this age where he has more subjects than God, who more who obey him rather than God. All but a few are in his grasp on account of their laxity. You know, Jesus himself called Satan or the devil a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And he means the, the beginning. Think about when he approaches Eve and also Adam with her, right? He says, uh, you know, you will not die, right, if you eat of this tree. And he says, you will be like God. And that's why he doesn't want you to eat of the tree, is you're going to be like him. Well, kind of breaking news here, you are already like God. They are. Adam and Eve were like God, made in the image and likeness of God. So, as Chrysostom is saying, and as Paul is saying, the prince of this air deceives people, and thinking that there's something missing that he can um, pour out that God is holding back. And that's just an outright and abject lie. 
Verse 5, made us alive together with Christ. Now he gets into this theology of grace, as we would call it, theology of grace. Great paradox here, right? The Christian is made alive, but he's made alive by no other means than by the death of Christ. That's why Paul keeps saying things like, I preach nothing other than Christ crucified. For him, it's not an image of a Roman execution. It's the image of salvation and freedom through our Lord Jesus Christ, who offered up divine love on the cross for the salvation of the world. For Paul, it's an image of divine resurrection life. Notice, too, that Paul's concept of salvation is not merely individualistic, not by a long shot. It's a community. He uses the word together, implying that the mystery of salvation belongs to the whole of the church, not even just the Ephesians, but beyond them. But suddenly, Paul interrupts his own thought, which he's known to do on occasion, and uh, he does so to call attention that, to the following that this initiative on God's part was totally gratuitous, totally gratuitous, undeserved. The salvation is depicted as something that has already taken place. As I said, as Catholics we can say, I have been saved, I'm being saved, I hope to be saved. It's interesting, in the Greek, the word that Paul uses, saved, is in the perfect tense, which simply means that it's a past event that has actions continuing in the, into the future. Um, like, for example, in uh, Luke's Gospel, he uses the word kakaratomene. Say it with me. Kakaratomene. And that's the word when uh, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, Hail, full of grace. Full of grace is kakaratomene, which actually means having been filled with grace in the past and continues to be filled in the present tense. In other words, perfect tense means something that happened in the, in the past but has ongoing action. So kakaratomene means Mary was filled to the fullness of grace at her immaculate conception, right? And in a similar but different way, Paul is talking about that you have been saved, right? But it's something that happened in the past, so he's thinking of Christ on the cross, but he looks at his Ephesians and says, there are ramifications of salvation that continue now. Which is why I think he goes on to say in verse 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved, but then he talks about the relationship of faith and works. And what's that relationship? Well, it's a relationship that, you know, faith is, is what precedes everything, right? Grace is what the foundation that everything is built upon. Paul wants to warn them that they were made to do good works in advance. Remember all this predestination stuff before the world began. All the blessings have been already infused, poured out, prepared for us. And our job is to cooperate with them. Let's just clear this up while we're on the topic. A lot of people get hung up on this kind of so-called debate between faith and works. For Paul, there's a symbiotic relationship. They work together as brother and sister, right? James says, faith without works is dead, right? But Paul will also insist in a different way that, you know, we don't do these good works on our own. We're not saved by our good works. So how do we find our way through this? Well, Paul is telling us right here. Let's read again verses 8, 9, and 10. By grace you've been saved through faith. Not through your works, but through faith, right? And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. What's Paul worried about here? Spiritual pride. Spiritual pride. For we, ha we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, or another way of putting it would be to do good works. We're created to do good things. Um, I have, you know, and if, I, if there's someone here who's a Protestant, I hope that I'm not offending you by what I say next here. But I, I, I used to... Um, frequent an evangelical church for about seven, eight years before I came back to the Catholic Church, as I mentioned last week. And some of my friends at that church, where I began to part company with, um, they'd stop going to church. Like one guy said, you know, stop, stop going to church. And then I'd see him somewhere and say, hey, you know, so-and-so, how come you're not in church? He's like, well, you know, I don't like this church anymore. I've got to find a new one someday. I'm like, you know, just haven't found one yet. I'm like, well, you've got to get back to church. Even as a Protestant, I knew, like, going to church, like, you've got to do, right? And he said, you know, it's all good, Steve. I mean, I I'm saved. There's nothing I can do to lose my salvation. And my heart was sad for him in that moment because I, I saw him, he was really in a, a stuck place. He was unsatisfied with his church community, and so he just decided to pull back and said, I have no, you know, no culpability at all here, nothing that I have to do or ought to do because it's the right thing, even if it's hard. But Paul would say otherwise. Paul would say out of a heart of gratitude, we open up our heart and our mouth to God. 
And more than that, we, with the charity that is flowing in us and through us through Christ Jesus, are called to give that away, to be rivers and not reservoirs. But he just wants to make sure that we know that it is not that river of stuff flowing out of us that saves us. Right? The last sentence is the key. In verse 10, when he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for or to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, with each human person, right? It's as if God has already the vision of all the beautiful things that they might be able to do in cooperating with him. But we yet have to do that by walking in them. And by doing those things, we're, cooper we're cooperating with grace. We're not earning it, but we are walking with God in cooperation with him. But he is the one who has designed us in such a way to do these good things. His mother, Teresa, would say, do something beautiful for God, right? But she knew that all the things that the missionaries of charity do are happening because God already ordained them to be taken place in and through them. Let's look at verse 11 through 22. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it here, but I do want to make a few comments on it. Um, in this section, Paul is really now turning from primarily Jews to Gentiles and addressing what the Gentiles need to understand. In verse 11 and 12, he, he says that they are Gentiles in the flesh, they were Gentiles in the flesh, separated from Christ, strangers to the covenant. By covenant, he means the Old Testament promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Israelites. Now, to be clear, Paul is not, is not, putting Jews over Gentiles. But he is reminding them that in salvation history, God had done something remarkable through his chosen people. Talking here about the children of Abraham. As Gentiles, they were originally outside of this economy of salvation. But he also will tell them in this section, and if you've been reading it, as we hope you have been, You'll see he talks about things like circumcision and so on. The circumcision alone did not save the Israelites, individually or collectively. But it did mark them off as belonging to God. Now, in Christ, salvation is possible for both Jews and Gentiles, beginning with this great uh, grace of baptism, which he's been talking about. Uh, verse 15, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. I like what St. John Chrysostom has to say. He says, don't you see, top of page 14, don't you see, um, the Greek does not have to become a Jew, rather both enter into a new condition. And it's not as though the Greek loses his Greekness or the Jew loses his Jewness, so to speak, right? But there is a new creation. Paul says elsewhere, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Paul envisions this larger church, right, the superabundant church, infused with God's grace that's comprised of all of humanity, Jews and Gentiles. This great diversity. How is this all held together? Now he comes to this great part of the prayer where again he kind of focuses on the Trinity. Look at verse 18. For through him we both have access to the one, to the one spirit, in the one spirit to the Father. Very Trinitarian line here, right? Through Christ we have access in the one spirit to the Father. And St. Marius, kind of an, a lesser known saint, says, it really emphasizes that it's all about in the one spirit. It's the one Holy Spirit that unites us. And Paul's going to come back to that in just a few moments when he talks about one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. He keeps using this word one, right? For which Paul means the unity in which we are all bound together. St. Marius says, every Gentile and Jewish believer now have access in prayer to the king of the universe. Actually, that's not a saint or a saint in the making. That's Peter Williamson, but still a great line. Every Gentile and Jew now have access to, in prayer, to the king of the universe. Ever think of it that way? Every time we pray, we have access to the king of the universe. Verses 19 through 21, um, Thomas Aquinas observes that there seems to be two foundations that, that Paul's talking about. He talks about the foundation of the apostles, and he talks about the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. I'll let you read my notes, but oh, we synthesize what Aquinas is saying. He's saying there's not two foundations, but one. So it's not like there's the apostles and prophets over here, and there's the cornerstone of Christ over there. No, no, no. He says, when you stand on the, uh, on the foundation of the apostles, you're standing on the foundation of, of Christ Jesus because they are his representatives. Right? We profess every time we go to Mass that we are part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
And what St. Thomas Aquinas and what our church wants us to know is that we can have great confidence, full confidence in our apostolic faith. And St. Paul is, is taking great measures to make sure that this apostolic theology saturates the Ephesians. Let's move on and talk a little bit about chapter 3. I'm already a happy camper because my goal was to at least crack the cover on chapter 3, so woohoo for us. Uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 1. For this reason, Paul says, I, a prisoner of, for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which is not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So, Paul's always going to do the both and. He's first going to say, here was your condition, Gentiles, before salvation came. You were outside of the promises, okay? You were outside of the covenant of Abraham, and it kind of gives them all the bad news. But he's going to do that for the purpose of sort of revealing the good news, and now we're just right in the, in the middle of it that they are fellow heirs with the Gentiles, with the Jews. This is the great mystery of God, that what was once outside is now welcomed in to the kingdom of God. Verse, eight, uh, verse 1, notice that Paul said he was a prisoner of Christ. I think there's a double meaning here. On the literal level, as we saw last week, Paul was indeed in prison, right? But on a spiritual level... Paul is very comfortable with the term slave, servant, prisoner of Christ because all these mean I belong totally to Christ, holding nothing back. And what he's really doing for the Ephesians and for us is modeling what he wants us to become, which is totally given over, holding nothing back in our mind, in our hearts, in any measure, right, from Jesus Christ. Totally trusting the promises with which he's given himself to us. Um, let's look at verses 9 and 10, um, more about this mystery. And um, here the Catechism has some helpful words, middle of page 15. From the beginning until the fullness of time, the joint mission of the Father's Word and Spirit remains hidden. Hidden. But it is, but it is at work. God's Spirit prepares us for the time of the Messiah. Neither is fully revealed, but both are already promised to be watched for and welcomed at their manifestation. So, for this reason, when the church reads the Old Testament, she searches for what the Spirit who has spoken through the prophets wants to tell us about Christ. And I just want to put a plug in here on these lines for reading the Old Testament. Um, probably, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys have so much good, rich theology here and so many different topics. But I think still some of us get stuck and hung up on the Old Testament. I would urge you, um, if you're doing a Bible reading plan, not to hold back from reading through, on some level, some of the major outlines of the, um, of the Old Testament. I've got a book in the, past, in, in the back called Walking with God by my good friend Tim Gray. He basically goes through all the narrative of the Old Testament, but in a way that I think will help you make sense of it whether it's a book like that or something else, or maybe the catechesis you're getting here. Um, as we read the Old Testament, we're reading and searching the Old Testament with the mind of Christ. And the catechism wants to remind us just what a treasure we have in the Old Testament and not only in the New. Um, it's clear here that the manifold wisdom comes through the church. But Paul does not say that it is manifest to the Gentiles, though it is, Rather, he says that it is manifest to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. In other words, the angels. Paul, what on earth are you talking about? Let us see at the bottom of 15. Thomas Aquinas asked this question. Does this mean that the apostles taught the angels? And the answer is no. He settles instead, Thomas does, that... Um, the angels were instructed through the church that is through apostolic preaching in such a way that they, were, um, that they were not taught by the apostles, but in them, if you follow what Thomas is saying. In other words, certain mysteries were not revealed to the angels or to anyone, but known only to God. In other words, what Thomas is saying is that as the apostolic preaching is unfolding, even the, even the angels are learning things. Isn't that astounding? 
They're learning things in the sense that belonged only in the mind of God to be revealed in the fullness of time. And now through what the apostles are doing, even the angels are taking notice at what's happening. Astounding. Um, chapter 3, 14 through 21. If we finish this, we'll be in great shape. Uh, divinization, Paul's prayer and petitions for the Ephesian church. Page 16. Here at the end of chapter 3, Paul brings to a close this section on doctrine or uh, proclamation. And he does so, once again, in the form of a prayer, kneeling before the fathers in his words. Let's take a look at verse 16 through 19. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power in his spirit in your inner being. Rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Some of the most beautiful words in all of the New Testament. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Notice that Paul doesn't simply say strengthened, but strengthened with power. Paul met that glorious power on the road to Damascus. And it's his yearning and his prayer that all the Ephesians and all of us would tap into and draw upon that power. That you're, that, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. I'm in the middle of, of uh, 16 here. But why is Paul praying that the Messiah dwell in the hearts of his readers if they are already in Christ? Does that make sense? And therefore already have Christ living in their hearts. The fact is that what Paul is teaching them, and I think teaching us, is that there are degrees of living in Christ and having Christ live in us. C.S. Lewis once said about the Chronicles of Narnia, or in that series, right, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, this famous phrase, further up and further in. And that's the Christian life, right? Further up and further in. Further up into the mystery, further into the kingdom of God. In other words, he's saying you're in Christ, but now become what you are. See, for Paul, it all goes back to this great vision of what God has done before they were even born. And dare I say, before we were even born. This is what makes the letter to the Ephesians so great. It's so rich in terms of helping us understand all the blessings and power that are, um, are, are, um, we're privy to in our spiritual lives before we were even baptized, before we were even born. There's plenty of room for growth here, Peter Williamson says, and Paul is praying that his readers will go all the way. And it's my prayer for me, and it's my prayer for you as well, that we would go all the way with Christ. And to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. Here Paul prays that his readers may realize and have the personal experiential knowledge of Christ's love for them. One of my fears today is that many Catholics have a great awe for God in the sense that he's kind of the, the great being beyond, right? Beyond space and time and this kind of austere magnitude of God. But I think a message that we need to help carry to all of our Catholic brothers and sisters is the nearness of God, right? The God who walks in the garden and talks to Adam and Eve. The God who came to Moses at the burning bush. The God who came to the world in the form of the Christ child in the manger, right? And the God who is still speaking today through his word. God is near us. He is speaking to us. Are we listening? In sum... It could be said that Paul's prayer in chapter 3 is a prayer of total transformation, or you might say total conversion, so that they would become containers as full with God's fullness so that they are overflowing. It's a beautiful picture of a life well lived, right? Overflowing with the goodness of God. Though perplexing as it sounds to some, the end of this process is known in Catholic theology as theosis or divinization. To be clear, this is not to be understood as though the perfecting of our union with God ends up, up with our becoming God, with a capital G. No. But it does mean that the Christian hope is that we become God, with a small g, that is to say, we are totally transformed into his image. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. That's from 1 John. And it's of the same mind as St. Paul. We can throw in St. Peter, who in his epistle says, we are partakers of the divine nature. 
And with that, let's, I think we've done enough for tonight. We've, we've accomplished a lot. We're just about there. So let me say a closing word in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and for coming to us in your word of truth. I pray for each and every one of the people here and for those who are listening or viewing online that you would help us to open up our hearts in coming days to this great message of the book of Ephesians. Draw us together into the great mystery as we pray the prayer that you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Smith. Okay, on page 10, um, you have, a, when you quote right, it was the shorthand summary of the theology, which in turn was the foundation for the central pillar of the new world view. Mm -hmm. When I hear that, mm -hmm. it sounds so Protestant, you know, because they don't want to know the church is the pillar and foundation. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it set my teeth on edge. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I agree. Good. You know, um, N.T. Wright is uh, one of my favorite go-to scholars, but I would, I'd be the first one to add, this is an impor important point here, that the kind of sources that you want to read as a Catholic, first and foremost, would be those that are in keeping with the magisterium. Now, sometimes in my classrooms, my seminarians are, not usually, but sometimes they're scandalized that I would even quote from, like, why are you quoting him, and, you know, why don't you stick with Aquinas? And um, I kind of follow the... Um, the spirit of uh, Pope Leo the 13th, when he wrote an encyclical in 1893, in fact, the first uh, document on scripture, he certainly urged uh, all Catholics to have the mind of the church, the heart of the church, but he was also one trying to seek um, understanding and find understanding from others who were outside of the church too. And, and so he didn't, didn't prohibit that completely, but he was very cautious about making sure that um, that uh, we, we, we had our, put our ducks in a row and make sure that we begin with the mind of the church. So you should have, when you're doing Bible study, good Catholic commentaries like Peter Williamson. You should draw on the tradition. And, you know, I've been quoting a lot from Thomas Aquinas. Um, but sometimes I find that there are others who are outside of the Catholic faith that have some good things to be able to teach us and challenge us. And I think Wright is one of those persons on the book of, uh, on, on St. Paul in general. But I would also add, and I'm so glad you brought it up, that sometimes when you read theologians like this, what you begin to see are what I tend to think of as blind spots. Uh, I tend to agree with Wright in what he says, but I tend to go beyond him is the way I would put it. And I think it's very good and very sharp of you to be kind of noticing sometimes the way that he puts things. He's got a lot of good things. You can trust him in, in general ways. But um, yeah, I think having a good sense of the Catholic faith will alert you to um, have good ears and eyes to, to be alert to when something sounds maybe just a little bit not the way it ought to be put is a, is a good thing to end on. So yeah. Uh, you said it, you said earlier uh, in Ephesians that uh, we are created in Christ for good works and that are pre-planned by the Father, and then it says in James that uh, faith without works is dead. And I may be getting ahead of myself a little on Oakman Luther here, but why did the reformers throw out the James version? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, my my short answer would be. Uh, Martin Luther, in particular, was very suspect of it because it didn't fit his theology. You know, there's a lot of politics and a lot of ecclesiology and the theology that we can't get into with, with Martin Luther and the Reformation. But the short answer that I would give is that it made him uncomfortable. In the same way, though, he, I mean, he, wanted, he called uh, the Epistle of James an Epistle of Straw. Uh, can you imagine that? The, 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 the book of the New Testament, the, the letter of James... An epistle of straw. Why? Because it didn't match his theology of, you know, by faith alone, Luther's faith alone. In the same way, he thought the book of Revelation was, in his words, odd. Okay, well, it's odd, but it has great truths to teach us, I'll tell you that. Uh, so the, the interesting thing about, about that time, of course, was that you have a lot, of, um, a lot of antagonism towards the magisterium. And so when Martin Luther, from his perspective, was trying, in, in, in his eyes, to bring about a kind of a renewal or reformation. What he was also doing in the process was um, 
was making his own parochial decisions about what seemed to square with his theology, right? And that's always a problematic. When you read the Church Fathers, you read St. Jerome, St. Jerome had his own opinions, but he always, at the end of the day, as a good Catholic, came back to what the mind of the Church taught and would set his own positions aside. For example, St. Jerome had some questions about the Deuterocanonical books, but unlike Martin Luther, he saw that the whole Church was accepting these books of Maccabees and Sirach and Wisdom of Solomon and the other great books, seven books of the um, Old Testament that are called Deuterocanonical, where Martin Luther said, no, let's kind of get rid of them because they contain papist teachings, right? And so he saw in the Maccabees the teachings of prayer for the dead, something that belonged to the Middle Ages and this kind of thing and wasn't part of the original scriptural tradition. Um, interesting is that Martin Luther was kind of an anxious man, as you know. And when he took those books out of the Old Testament, by the way, they weren't added by the church. They were always part of the Catholic tradition in the larger sense. Martin Luther took them out. He didn't want to completely take them out of the Bible, so he put them in an appendix at the end. He's always kind of afraid God was going to strike him with lightning kind of thing, right? So maybe put him there and, you know, let's kind of put him in the back. And then you can find some old Protestant versions. I saw one in a museum from like the 1700s, you know, this kind of thing. They actually had it in the appendix. And then at some point they just kind of made their way out altogether. Today, a lot of Protestants will call the deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament apocryphal, which is actually not very helpful because it sounds as though they were, you know, kind of fictional or myth mythological. Those books are amazing books. You should read Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Baruch. These are amazing books. And if you're here and you're Protestant, I say, read those books. You're not going to, lightning's not going to strike from the sky if you read them. They're amazing books. So thank you for your question. Doctor, just following up on that, obviously uh, St. Paul was not writing to Lutherans right. or to Luther. So, so what, what was the original context of his comment? Why would this have been a point of contention to those he was writing to? Well, I think the point of contention was, remember, and this is, the, this is an important teaching point for all, reading all of Paul's letters, that a major conundrum that's going on in the early church is this influx of Gentiles, right? We've got the gospel going out to all sorts of people, um, Jews and Gentiles. And some of what is going on here underneath it is the, are the tensions that are between them. Does the Gentile have to be circumcised and so on and so forth? And a lot of what, um, a, a lot of what is underneath Paul's teaching on works, and this gets a little bit complicated, we'll try to keep it simple, has to do with what are known as uh, ritual laws. So Paul would not say that we, we live by faith without works. He, would always, he just told us right here that we need to be having... Um, faith and works working together. Um, James, on the other hand, will say faith without works is dead. Um, what we could say with regard to the Apostle Paul is he wants both Jews and Gentiles to know that it's not their cultural, um, their, their cultural identity that's saving them. So if you're a Jew, it's not because you were circumcised alone that you were saved. As I like to say, circumcision didn't save you. It kept you on the road to salvation. It reminded you that you were saved. It didn't save you. That's Paul's understanding. Right? It's not that, that alone being circumcised was enough to gain heaven. Paul would say the law itself was your tutor, but it doesn't save you. The, the law for Paul is like a mirror. It shows you the fact that you can't keep it on your own, right? So Paul, I think, would say to Jews, don't rest on your cultural background, but he would also say to Gentiles, you must give your all to God, and so therefore you do need to do good works. It's a both and. Um, question. When Paul is talking about uh, works, and sometimes I get lost in the uh, intellectual or the spiritual, Spiritual uh, Catholic social teaching has a concept of human flourishing through works. Is is there? A, can you make any or human flourishing that Im, implication? My, yeah. Can you make any tie in there between the spiritual, intellectual, I think so. and contemporary? I mean, the way I used to describe works is faith working through charity. Charity in the active sense is a verb, right? So when we actualize our faith in some tangible way. It could be prayer, it could be working in a soup kitchen, it could be doing something for someone, some act of kindness. That is an act of faith, but it's done through charity, which is an active, it's a verb, you know, it's faith with blue jeans on, right? I also thought of the place I was thinking of where, where Paul really critiques works, and that's in the letter to Galatians, which we're obviously not studying. But when you read Galatians, he seems to be very hard on works, as, a, as though they're not really necessary there. He's really coming down on them. But in that context, he's talking to, in the background of Galatians, there's a group known as Judaizers who want um, Gentiles to kind of follow the Jewish ceremonial laws. 
And the problem with that is you're kind of taking one cultural identity and replacing it for another. And Paul's saying, wait a minute, it's not your cultural identity that's saving you. You said Mary continues to grow in grace in heaven. Did I say that? Something like that. Okay. Close to it. I would uh, say, I would, I would, if I did, I would, I would edit my remarks and say she's already full with the fullness of grace. But yeah. Can't you get more? We can, yeah, and that's the whole point. This is why we call Mary our hope. So I remember I was talking to a Protestant one time and said, you Catholics, you, th you worship Mary, don't you? I mean, I heard a prayer, you Catholic prayer that says, Mary our hope. And I said, yes, we believe Mary is our hope. And he's like, was Mary up there on the cross? And I said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding the point. To say Mary is our hope, let's recall that Mary was a human being, right? Mary is not, is not God, right? But to say Mary is our hope is to see what God has done in her through Jesus Christ, right? Um, my daughter, who's 11, is just trying to understand the Immaculate Conception. The way I explained it to her, and maybe you've heard this before, it's like there's a pit there, right? And we all have fallen into the pit of sin, right? Mary was saved from falling into that pit at the Immaculate Conception by the grace of Christ applied back in her life. God, God works outside of time and space. So God, you might say, prevented her from falling into what we have. That is why she is our hope. When we look to her, we see the, 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 the human being fully alive to God, not marred by sin. That's why she's our hope. Not because um, she has saved us, but because she has been saved and lived that out fully in her yes to God. And maybe this is a good time to pray the, uh, the Hail Mary. Why don't we, right? In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. And thank you so much for letting me be with you once again. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.